much for being here and for this uh, opportunity. I'm John Silva. I'm from Brazil, and I'm the uh, the head of developer relations at Zoop. So why Brazil matters to open source and to us all here? Uh, according to uh, Even Data Corporation, this is a study I'm following through the past years. Brazil become the 50th largest uh, developer community population in the world in four years. So we're gonna pass over Japan and we, we are leading uh, this growth in Latin America, which is the second region that is growing uh, much faster in the world. And in the past 10 to 15 years ago, Brazil, has a huge open source community. Open source was really huge in Brazil. And just to illustrate how huge this was, I'm not talking only about community. I've heard about policies today. This is a picture, a couple of pictures taken from uh, the International Free Software Forum from 2009. It was the 10th edition of the forum. And uh, this guy with the red hat is, is uh, Brazilian president, former president Lula, uh, talking with Simon Phipps and also Bruno Souza. And yes, he's wearing a Java ring. And also he's using an ODF cap. Some of you might remind, uh, remind me from the ODF days. I was the ODF executive director for ODF Alliance in Latin America. And I was on the eye of the hurricane of that open uh, open XML uh, versus ODF fight we had on ISO a couple of years ago. So after all this hype, uh, all the movement and all the excitement faded away. But open source is now mainstream all over the world and also here in Brazil. The good part of it, everyone is using it. And it works. We weren't a bunch of crazy freedom fighters at the time. It works. And the bad part of it, people don't know what it is anymore. So long story short, I spent eight years working at Intel in the hardware side of the industry. And I'm back to pure software. And this is what I found when I came back. Free as in beer all over again. License what? People don't know nothing about licenses. Yeah, this is true. Also, intellectual property rights is something that they don't know nothing about. And by the way, in Brazil, we don't have software patents, so it makes things much, much more complicated here to talk about IPR. And it's the same on Latin America, okay? I'm talking about Brazil, but it's the same all over Latin America. I was working on Latin America over the past 10 years. And also, people really think that open source means it's on GitHub on a public repository, right? Yes, I'm listening to those kind of questions, not only for developers, but for entrepreneurs, from company owners, from everyone involved in open source software. And it's a huge population of people that only use open source, that they, they start using open source on the college. They use open source over the past 10 years, but they really don't know what it is about. So this is how I feel. Oh God, what have I done? Why we stop it talking to this, those guys? Why we stop it explaining to people what open source is about? And this is what we have to do. We need to start it all over again to revamp the communities and to revamp basically contributions. We need to explain to people uh, much more about open source, how they can get involved and what are their role and responsibilities on this. We need to retake the open source conversation. And what motivated me to build this presentation is because I spent the past two months talking with friends from open source community all over the world, sharing what I'm facing in Brazil. And guess what? It's the same on several other countries. It doesn't matter if it's Asia, if it's Europe, if it's US, North America, anywhere else. So startups are built on open source. Enterprises are running on open source today, including banks. Developers are using open source, but they really don't know what they are doing. Actually, they know what they are doing, but they really don't know what they are doing. So developers need to know their role and their force and their powers behind the scenes. And I do believe that we need to do something about it. The company I work for, and we are proud to sponsor this event, is Zoop. I invite you to take a look on this website where we have information about our open source projects. And we will be available to talk to you on the next Huawei session. And I can answer questions and talk more about what we are uh, opening uh, our projects down here. And this is uh, the question that I left for you. How is that in your country? Are we talking to developers, not the senior guys, but the young ones? 
what we can do about it. Thank you so much. This is, those are my contacts. Please keep in touch and let us face this together. Thank you. Next up, we have Javier. Hi, my name is Javier Perez. I'm open source program manager for IBM. And it is time to spell out open source software for mainframes. Uh, mainframes today look more like the picture that you see at the bottom, not the image that most of us have uh, with the picture on, on top. Uh, it's been decades of innovation uh, since the 1950s. And some of the technologies or some of the uh, concepts and architecture ideas that we see today in the cloud, things like virtual machines, containers, workload isolation, they've been around in the mainframe for many, many years, and they have been actually perfected over, over the years. Uh, things like continuous availability and disaster recovery, it's been there for many, many years and continues to improve. Uh, things like encryption and cryptography, uh, you have the best platform out there uh, with the mainframe. And in fact, it's not called mainframe anymore, it's IBM Z. And we have IBM Z and a Linux One, a couple of uh, versions of this platform. IBM Z, where you can co-locate different operating systems, or Linux One, that is exclusively just for, for Linux. And let me give you a couple of numbers of this uh, great uh, best performance uh, platform. Uh, you can have up to 1 trillion uh, web transactions, HTTP transactions per day. You can have more than 2 million Docker containers in the platform. Uh, you can compress a lot of data. You can compress up to 275 gigabytes of data per second. Uh, so very am amazing numbers that you get with this, uh, with this platform. And, and of course, it's all about open source, right? Uh, open source actually it's been around since 1955 in the mainframe. Uh, there was a, they created a group called Share, a group that is still around actually, and they had their conference just uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it was a volunteer uh, run user group back then, and they was created to share information about the, the software in the mainframe. So back then it was not called open source, but you can trace. Uh, some of the origins of open source uh, in, with that with that group that is still still around, and of course Linux has been around for many years as well. You know about thirty years, uh, but it was deployed, it was installed uh, with big investments from IBM uh, into a mainframe back in two thousand. So so we are twenty years now of uh, continuous improvements on Linux, uh, optimized the Linux. Yes, they opened the, st the same standard open source Linux to take advantage of the features of, of this platform. Uh, and in fact, their numbers uh, are amazing. Like most enterprises now run um, the mainframes, the IBM Z and Linux One uh, on Linux. And when we talk about Linux, we talk about that they, it runs everywhere, right? From your mobile device to any type of uh, architecture. We talk about ARM or ARM64 for uh, things like Raspberry Pi or Arduino to, of course, common servers on x86 or power or even Spark, there are still a few around there. Uh, the processor architecture for the mainframes is known as S390X. And all you have to do is to uh, you know, have a compiled version of Linux in the corresponding processor architecture. And the same goes to your software. And, and again, it, regardless if it's a mainframe or it's a Raspberry Pi, you have to compile on the corresponding architecture. So here are a few technical considerations when you're looking into porting your software, uh, especially open source software, uh, to your uh, mainframe IBM, IBM Z or Linux One. Um, by the way, most of the software really just works, right? You just have to recompile it or build it again, uh, maybe just some minor changes, but it, it just works. If there are specific functionality that it was for other processor architecture, well, that's what you have to, to address or making changes, especially, specifically if they were uh, just, just you know, custom for that processor architecture. And really the only difference is uh, the use of uh, big endian memory allocation. If you are doing low level uh, memory allocation um, with the IBM Z uh, platform, it's based on the big Indian memory allocation, corresponds to the most significant byte or least significant byte allocation. And again, it's only for low level memory allocation. And of course, you can always take advantage of uh, 
you know, the, the features, the compression, the speed to improve your software while you are porting to uh, this platform. I'm going to leave you with this uh, slide. Uh, these are some of the most recognizable uh, logos there on open source software out there. They are all of the, these are available in IBM Z and Linux One, and I invite you to keep contributing to open source. It is really easy to port your software to this uh, great high performance platform. And with that, thank you very much, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Next up, we have Christina. All right, how are we doing? Can you hear me now? Yep, you're loud and clear. Thank you. My name is Christina Hoopy, and I am a Senior Education Program Manager at GitLab. And today I'm going to be talking about open source, a unique opportunity for career development in underserved and underrepresented populations trying to enter the, the tech industry. Um, so first, if you have not heard of GitLab, um, we are the only um, complete end-to-end -end application for the DevOps lifecycle. Um, we are also an open core company, and we have a very active open source um, community. To, so shout out to anyone who's um, listening today who's part of our community. We have over 3,000 code contributors and an average of 200 different uh, contributions a month. So I want to start off by taking a little bit of a look of, about some demographic data for the, the tech industry. Um, this is some data from the, the Stack Overflow survey and then also some data compiled from, um, uh, from Wired Magazine. And if we look at the, the tech industry by gender, we can see that it's very heavily male dominated at over 91%. Um, and then it's also um, also dominated at 72% by, by white. And so there is a lack of diversity um, in the tech industry. And, and the data from Wire show that despite some of the efforts by the, the big tech companies over the last four or five years, we definitely have um, room for improvement in increasing uh, diversity in the tech industry. Uh, this is a great figure that summarizes some of the barriers for people um, trying to enter the, the tech industry, all the way from at the beginning, um, a lack of social capital and social networks to bias in hiring and bias in advancement opportunities. Um, and I think it's really important to note that even just getting that first foot in the door um, is, is a struggle and, and the lack of experience um, is, is part of that. Building up, building up the resume from the, the very beginning. And what I wanna really focus on today in the few minutes um, that we have is to talk about what's different about open source and how open source can help remove some of these barriers. Um, first of all, open source by nature has an everyone can contribute mentality. Um, so the more contributors in general, uh, the better off obviously an open source project is. Um, it also has a self-service mentality. So our repos, our docs, are you know, getting started, the community, the governance is all publicly generally available um, and, and people can find it and, and read it and learn how to access it. Um, also something that's really unique is that there are feedback mechanisms in place. So if you make a, a code request, a merge request, there's going to be an advanced developer who's part of the community who's going to review your work and give you feedback. Um, and that, that's actually a great natural setup for mentoring. Um, we know that not all open source communities are perfect, and some of them um, can be a little bit inclusive. Uh, there can be a high technological barrier. Um, and so we definitely, you know, as an, as, a, as, as an industry, as a community, as a sector, we definitely have room to grow in that regard. Um, and what I want to just say today is that um, some of the things that open source projects can do to help remove that barrier and stop leaks in the tech pipeline is to be intentional and inclusive to new contributors, um, encourage mentorship within your open source projects, and value um, those, those low barrier contributions. So not just the, the very technical contributions, but simple contributions, help people um, kind of get started. And what I want to do is share some of the things that we do at GitLab to help with these contributions. 
Um, we have a, uh, a good for new contributors label. I'm sorry, um, someone clicked on my link there, so it's, it's grayed out. But um, the idea is that we have a label in GitLab that says good for new contributors. And so if you're someone trying to enter the tech industry, we have really low barrier um, issues that you can work on. We have meetups specifically for new contributors. Um, we have merge request coaches that are all available on, on our handbook. You can find them. We actually have a page. Um, they're publicly listed. Uh, they're available in, in actually in the platform. You can message um, at gitlab-org-coaches on your merge request. And our team um, it really prides themselves on helping you get through, get your, your change merged. Uh, we also have um, we our team, the community relations team, connects um, the community members with experts through through merge requests um, through our forum at forum.getlab.com uh, through Gitter as well. And then we also really value and make a big effort to to celebrate first time contributors, including sending them swag. We have a dashboard there. I encourage you to take a look at that. Um, new contributor um, label, and then also um, social social mentions. And then I'd like to stop with just talking a little bit about a, a great partnership that we have at GitLab. Um, we're working with the Last Mile, which is an organization that prepares um, incarcerated individuals for re-entry entry into, into society. And um, we've done over five meetups with them in the last couple months. And we've had our, our CEO, Sid, and, and some of our technical evangelists teach about, um, about GitLab and DevOps in general. We're also mentoring them on, on the technical recruiting pipeline and process. Um, and in a few days, we're going to have our first Everyone um, Can Contribute uh, meet up for first time contributors um, with it with with the last mile. So um, I'm really excited to share some of these best practices with you and I would love to, to connect with the audience and I'll look out for questions. Thanks. Next up we have Stephen Jacobs. All right, so I'm here to tell you a little bit about a new university open source or really open programs office at RIT. Um, all right, so a little history on RIT and open source. I've been running programs initially called FOSS at RIT and then called FOSS at Magic from 2009. It's a student-centric, primarily undergrad effort that started with making educational games for the OLPC. Um, and a kind of a historical but also true article on what that program looks like is called the course of co-op life cycle over in opensource.com we had the first minor in open source for university and find more information about that there and we've been running something called uh, LibreCore, which has been a humanitarian focused co-op and intern program uh, for the past six or seven years. We just finished a contract with UNICEF Innovation, and you can find information about how that worked and the, the documents and stuff we created to help them build their open source pipelines and communities at that link. Um, in summer 2019, Johns Hopkins University, working with Moss Labs, which is primarily a municipal open source focus group, uh, soft launch uh, Johns Hopkins University OSPO. And taking that as a cue, I worked with my university starting November of 2019 to start pitching that idea to them. In February of 2020, they asked me to hold a, a campus-wide meeting to see what interest there might be. And what, what surprised me was the wide interest. We had 50 people from 37 units across campus who are SVP. That's just not computer science and IT. That's the library. That's our technical photography programs. That's digital humanities. Just a huge range of people who either were already working in open source, open data, open science, or people who wanted to learn more about how to move that forward. So in June, we got our approval to become a key research center within the university. And we have a charter that was derived primarily from a bunch of bottom-up meetings that we had after that first community meeting. Uh, we worked with about 20 to 25 faculty and staff members, even 
during pandemic and over Zoom to create a kind of master wish list that we then derived our charter from. And we became officially a part of the university just last month. And what we're going to be focusing on is discovering what people are doing on campus, because I know that there are plenty of people working in these spaces, but nobody knows who's doing what. Collect metrics on and promote those. Talk about what the university does in open work overall, which is what I'm using to include open source, open data, open hardware, et cetera. To go ahead and find and or point folks and create new professional development stuff on how you get involved in open or how to improve your open to advise but not take over compliance uh, with the CIO and legal and to work with development and alumni relations to find opportunities for grants, industry support programs, other networking programs. And last but not least, here is our website, which became live today, on which you can find a lot more information about what we hope to do. And since we're behind time, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and stop here and leave it open for questions in the shared notes or the public chat. Thanks. Up next, we have Elise Allison Wright. Hello, state of the sorcerers. Was I the first one to make that joke? I really hope not. Anyway, I'm Melissa Wright and I'm here to talk about a collaboration to bring an open source contribution model to the university setting generally and Johns Hopkins University Network specifically. And this is us being excited. Yay. So this is a open source collaboration um, led by John Hopkins uh, funded by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, uh, kind of uh, supported by the foresight of Indeed, and implemented by us at Open Source Collective. More yay! I'm Melissa Wright. I help lead open community and open partnerships at Open Source Collective. And at Open Source Collective, we look to build healthy and resilient and equitable open source ecosystems. We provide fiscal and legal infrastructure for open source with sustainability tools and integrations. And the FOSS Contributor Fund is a big part of that. The Contributor Fund has been pretty impactful in the company setting. So the kind of thesis question, excitement, yay, here, is what does the Contributor Fund look like in the university setting. So quick history of the Contributor Fund. Uh, this is a brainchild of Dwayne O'Brien and the Indeed team. Each month, uh, con internal contributors to open source, uh, they vote on the most meaningful, most impactful open source projects uh, for them. Those are tabulated and $10,000 uh, are contributed to the open source project um, winner. And so different to other sponsorship models, the FOSS Contributor Fund puts open source business viability into the hand of a company's technologists, thereby further democratizing open source sustainability. So a little example of that, one that's close to home, is OpenStreetMap. I've been part of the OpenStreetMap community for many, many years, um, and on the board of OpenStreetMap US. And we were an early, indeed, uh, recipient of their contributor for, for, for fund. And not only were we humbled by this, we didn't even know of a shared relationship, but the, uh, the contribution uh, allowed for mutual visibility and acknowledgement. And so that, from personal, allows us to segue to the university setting. Meet Saeed Chowdhury. Saeed is the brainchild of this contributor fund uh, collaboration. He is the Associate Dean of Research Data Management at John Hopkins University and a big proponent of bringing open source to the university. And so you would think, a John Johns Hopkins Contributor Fund would be 
pretty much a cut and paste of, uh, you know, in a company setting. No, it's a lot of what you might expect and a whole lot more. So some things to think about um, when considering open source at Johns Hopkins and open source, I think within the university setting, um, open source is at the heart of great research and development and the educational framework of JHU. But one must ask, what is the visibility of that commitment? Does the econ department know what open source projects the biostatistics department are relying on and or contributing to for their work? Can the hours of open source project en engagement be acknowledged in a professor's tenure portfolio? We're implementing a general, general contributor fund for John Hopkins and we're building technical tools that will accelerate the impact of contributor funds both for John Hopkins, hopefully to respond to some of those questions, but for the entire ecosystem, university, company, or otherwise. These tools will scale the contributor fund and also allow us to see the impact and assessment, and assessment of our FOSS contributions. These tools will empower the open source community of JHU to support the ecosystems they care about not just the high visibility projects of a many tiered network. So let's go back to the OpenStreetMap example. So let's say the statistics department loves OpenStreetMap. I mean, can't do prime statistics without it. But the infrastructure of OpenStreetMap that they really need is not exactly the shapefiles of OpenStreetMap, is a little bit further down the stack in the Peleus geocoder. Do they know that? How visible is that dependency and then in that impact like in the contribution model? These are things that we hope to surface uh, in, in our building of a contributor fund in the university and something that's um, much more sophisticated, scalable um, and nuanced uh, for, for everyone. So finally, just some guiding questions. Um, how do universities break down department silos in order to collectively collaborate on the ecosystems of open source? How do we acknowledge the university community in their work to sustain open source so that they can be recognized by the academy? And what is our responsibility to bring universities into the design of open source contribution models? These are all really great questions, questions that we hope to lend insight into as we build out this project. Questions that I hope that you will join us. And next up we have Robert Jacob. Hi. All righty, it all worked. That's fantastic. Thank you, Open Source uh, Initiative. Uh, very excited to be here. We've heard some great conversations and what I love to focus on is creating life and excitement in open source communities. So one of the things that I think is very important is creating to stop churn. And let's get into uh, a little bit of the story. Uh, just have to do the obligatory blip. Robert Jacoby, lots of agency work, former president of Joomla, uh, technically Open Source Matters, uh, solution ambassador and open source partnerships sort of expert. Let's get to the story then. So the story is about open source projects and communities. They typically come with a great idea at the beginning, a new operating system, a new content management system, something that's gonna really change the world. And there's a, a, a few people that are very integrated into that sort of technological aspect of it. So we're building something awesome and that can be really, really exciting. And you, you, know, you, you get sort of that tight, cohesive team to build the actual uh, beginnings of an open source project. A and as that gains momentum, we wind up getting an actual community and building a community. And then those are growing from social media, from the actual project websites, you know, GitHub, GitLab, all the other types of opportunities for both developers and now even non-developers to get involved within a project. And this is great. So now we have we have some bit of code, we have some bit of community, and then 
Uh, it's getting used. Stuff's happening. What's going on? Okay. Is, is, is there momentum? Are, is, is, is leadership leaving? Uh, are people getting less involved in the project? Are the economics of a specific project getting uh, taken away from it to some degree? So now what? What's, what's the important thing? And, and what I really believe is that we need to keep the continuous creation and development process going. And that really goes into building more, not necessarily more on top of it, not bloat or, uh, you know, feature nonsense and madness. It's really about keeping a, a level of excitement so that there is a level of churn that should be expected in a project and community. People are always going to come in and out. There, there might be some latest and greatest feature set that they're interested in implementing, taking advantage of for personal or, uh, you know, private corporate reasons. And they're going to dive in. They're going to do the best they can because that has some immediate value. That should be expected as part of a community and project that these sort of uh, open source ninjas are going to come in and out. But there also needs to be a level of sustainability for the maintenance, for the bug fixes, for the incremental uh, functionality and features that occur. But we should never, never be afraid of forcing that agenda of creating something new. We've seen that in you know many projects. The, the most recent example of is in the WordPress community where they implemented the Gutenberg blocks, which you know was was really like pretty much taking out the audio adapter from the iPhone. People were really uh, up in arms on it, but it kind of drove a technological level of advancement. They were creating and trying to build something new. Yes, there's still an infrastructure that an ecosystem that holds everyone in place, but people who were interested in something new and something exciting were able to dive in where they may have not been a part of a project that had sort of seemed to be like, oh, it's just another content management system. So these things need to happen, that there needs to be, you know, th that risk taking in open source projects, very similar to what companies need to do to keep themselves exciting and interesting to their audience, which might be consumers or other businesses. Open source communities have a constituency and that constituency is people and their free time. Why do, do they wanna be part of that community? It can be for many reasons, but one of the key ones is expecting an ability to create and innovate. And that's what I hope that people can get out of creating to stop the churn. People will come in and evolve with the project and make that happen. Don't be afraid, create and innovate. Thank you very much. Up next, we have Jim Hall. You have control. All right, so I'm uh, Jim Hall, and this is a fun talk about why Linux only has 16 colors. Now, I'm not talking about uh, graphics mode. Obviously, you get a lot more colors there, but what I'm really talking about is text mode. When you boot your computer up in text mode, why are you only getting these 16 foreground colors and these eight background colors? Why 16 and eight? And why do the colors look the way they do? Why do they look some other way? Well, it kind of all dates back to the original IBM PC, as many things in technology do. 1981 is when this standard got set with the IBM color graphics array, and that was the first IBM computer that could display color. So, uh, in order to understand this, you need to get a little bit of grounding for binary. A lot of you may know binary, but some of you don't. So a quick little brief here is that binary is either on or it's off. It's kind of like a light. It's either on or it's off. And uh, uh, each one of those on and off is called a bit. And computers like to count in uh, bytes, which is eight bits. So, uh, and, and numbers start from the right-hand side and they go 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128. But on these first four rows here, you can see I'm only counting the numbers one, two, three, and four, right? You can see that if I've only got the one bit lit up, then that's a one. If I've got the two bit lit up, obviously that's a two. If I've got both one and two lit up, that's a three and so on, right? So that's how binary works. And of course, we don't write binary out using uh, little light bulbs and little circles. We actually use little ones and zeros. And so that's how we're gonna talk about this throughout the rest of the talk. So. We can represent colors using any combination of red, green, and blue light. And so the IBM engineers, when they created the color graphics array, they knew that that's, that's all they needed. They just needed red, green, and blue light. 
And in fact, if all we're going to do, we can actually, in the simplest case, we can do a mixture of that where it's either uh, the red, green, or blue is on, or it's off. And so we can control each one of those colors, red, green, blue, or RGB. We can control that using those bits. And so you can see if I don't have any of the uh, of those bits turned on, I got zero, 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 I'm gonna get black. If I got zero, zero, one, only the blue bit is lit up. And so I'm getting blue and so on down the line to things like uh, white, where I'm gonna mix all of the colors, red, green, and blue equally. And that's gonna give me white. Now that only gives me eight colors, right? So I can only count up to eight in that case from zero to seven. So how do I get more colors? Well, if I'm a smart engineer at IBM, I know that if I add an extra bit, I can get double the number of colors. And so how does that work? So now I'm going to add what's called an intensity bit. So an intensity IRG, intensity RGB or IRGB. And so now the left-hand bit is now the intensity. And so if I have the intensity turned off, I'm just getting the colors uh, that are sort of low intensity colors. And if I have the intensity bit turned on, then I'm getting bright intensity colors. So I might choose like a, uh, in a simple case, I might say, okay, well, if the intensity bit's turned on, I'm going to turn all those lights on at full brightness. And if I have the intensity bit turned off, then I'm going to turn, I'm going to set those colors to some, let's say, mid tone or mid brightness value. And that means I can now get colors that are going from zero to 15. That's 16 colors, except, wait a second, I don't. Uh, black and bright black are the same black because there's nothing being lit up. Uh, but that's okay. Uh, we can fix that. Um, we can uh, we can say okay, if the light and if the low intensity colors that 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 first bit is a zero, then uh, any of the zeros in the RGB positions, I'm gonna just let those be off. But if they're on, I'm gonna turn them on to only just two thirds value, just like two thirds brightness. But at the high intensity, so if that first bit, the, the intensity bit is turned on, that's a one, then any zeros in the RGB positions, they're going to be only set at one third position, but any ones are set at full brightness, right? And so that gives me now an ability to have differentiation between uh, black and bright black. And so now that gives me this set of colors. So now I'm getting the colors that we are familiar with on a PC. And now I can, uh, I have colors that go black, blue, green, cyan, red, magenta, yellow, and white. And I have also the bright versions of that. And that's why you have a bright black. Uh, and now I can represent all the colors of the rainbow. Oh, shoot. I actually can't represent the colors of the rainbow because uh, rainbow, if you remember, actually has uh, orange in it. So red, uh, orange, yellow, green, and blue, indigo, and violet. And I can fake the other colors, but I don't have an orange in there. So that's okay. Uh, if we're a smart engineer at IBM, we're going to say, okay, we're going to turn that low intensity yellow uh, into an orange. And we're going to do that by setting one third on the green value. So uh, the uh, if we're asking for a low intensity yellow, uh, then the green is going to be set to a one third value. So that's going to give me something that is now orange. And so now I've got a list of colors that goes from 0 to 15. Uh, and uh, that is the full list of those 16 colors. And now that low intensity yellow has been renamed from yellow into orange, except we're not going to call it orange. We'll call it brown because we've got to mess it up somewhere. Uh, but that's why we have uh, the, the low intensity colors and those bright colors. Now, that's why we have 16 colors. But why do we only have eight colors in the background? Well, again, remember that Computers like to count in full bytes. A byte is eight bits. And so uh, we just used four bits, intensity RGB, for the foreground color. So there's four bits right there. And the background uh, colors, are they're clearly only picking up you know, half the colors. And so we're only getting uh, three bits on that one, right? Three bits for the background. So what's that last bit? That's seven bits there. So what's my last bit? What's the final eighth bit? Uh, on the uh, uh, that would fill this out. Well, it's the most important uh, uh, bit of, of all user interface design, and that is the blink bit. And so now that gives us a, a full byte. I have eight bits. That's a, that, that's a full byte. And that is uh, every time you represent color on a uh, on an IBM uh, uh, compatible display, you are using a full byte to display the, the, the text color and the background color and whether or not it's blinking. And so that is the full byte. And that is why uh, Linux only has these 16 foreground colors and eight background colors. So thank you very much. And up next we have Debbie. So hi, everyone. I am Deb Goodkin, and I'm the executive director of the FreeBSD Foundation. And I'm coming to you from beautiful, snowy Boulder, Colorado. So. 
see her. The purpose of my talk is to tell you about one of the oldest, largest, and most successful open source projects around, and uh, really how we can be a model for other open source projects. And I'm hoping that um, in the five minutes that I have with you, that um, that I can raise awareness about FreeBSD and our project, and help build bridges and connect us with op other open source projects. I mean, people do know about us, but you know, sometimes we get lost and or we're ignored because we're not the newest shiny open source project out there. Though I do believe we are one that, or we do have the coolness factor, sort of like what Linux had compared to Windows back in the day. So, um, trying to continue our, our growth, um, or by continuing our growth, uh, I think this will help benefit the open source ecosystem in general. So, what is FreeBSD? Now, I have to always say this because there's still people out there who believe that it's a Linux distribution, and it's not. So FreeBSD is a computer operating system, and, um, and it's a complete operating system. And uh, so that means it is the kernel user land, everything that makes an operating system package. Now, FreeBSD descended from Berkeley Unix, and which descended from the original Unix out of Bell Labs. And it's been around for 27 years, used by universities, corporations, and uh, individuals using it on their desktops. So this is a, an abridged um, you know, history of FreeBSD. So first you had Enix coming out of Bell Labs in 1969, and then uh, Berkeley also took it, and they were doing research and development on it too, and that started in 1974. And then FreeBSD and NetBSD branched out in 1993. And there's a lot of companies that use FreeBSD, you just don't really hear about it because it's not like they, they promote that their products are based on FreeBSD. But I, I selected a bunch of uh, recognizable companies here so you would see that. And you're probably using FreeBSD too because uh, Mac OS was based on FreeBSD. If you're watching movies, that those are all downstream, or um, I mean, those are um, all coming to you from uh, FreeBSD based servers. So, the goal of the project really is to provide software that may be used for any purpose and without any strings attached. So, the way that the uh, project works is first, it was based on the original model that they used in Berkeley, but over the 27 years, it's, um, they've been improving that model. Uh, to work, you know, as an open source project. And uh, so there's thousands of contributors and contributors are developers as well as other people who are uh, contributing like uh, advocacy, like what I'm doing right now. And then there's hundreds of committers and those committers are uh, individuals who can uh, actually submit changes to the source tree. And then we have a nine member elected core team who uh, governs and they lead the project. And those are um, democratically elected um, from, the, from the other committers on the project. And we do have a strong mentorship culture. Also, the FreeBSD Foundation, which I run, is a whole separate independent organization. We're a 501c3, and it means that we're, um, you know, we support the project for the public good. And our whole mission is to support the FreeBSD project and the community. When you look at how the project is formed or organized, it has, besides all these different people who are contributing in various ways, we have these functional teams that um, help support it by, um, we might have a security, or we do have a security team, release engineering, cluster admin, uh, documentation. And so that allows, for individuals to contribute with um, either using you know, their experience and expertise, or if they want to learn um, you know, a, a new area, they can be involved that way too. Uh, it is collaborative, and we do have a consistent release model, which really makes it easier for corporations who are using FreeBSD. And we do follow the principle of least astonishment philosophy that it's basically don't break things that work already. 
this is a way, um, it's really simplified visualization of how the, uh, how the community or project is organized. And you can see here on the top that the foundation and the project are totally separate uh, organizations. And then you have the core team and then you have all those functional teams underneath. Some reasons for people to contribute to FreeBSD and to the project, it's, it is an inclusive and welcoming community. Uh, it, it's a great way to learn systems programming and uh, study operating systems. And then because we are a smaller project, then it allows for you to make a contribution that could actually make a notable impact to the project. We do still have some of the original BSD uh, developers from uh, Berkeley who were students back then and um, as well as some of the FreeBSD founders, and they're all approachable, which makes it, it great. And it is democratically run. So how, how do we stay sustainable? It, it, you know, people, so getting more contributors, and we're always working on that. Uh, companies, uh, getting them to recognize the value of open source, and if they are using FreeBSD, to um, to encourage them to give back either financially or to uh, you know with their code upstreaming their code and finally with uh, with financial contributions from corporations from individuals uh, is the way that we're able to fund projects going forward so if you want to find out more about freebsd i would say suggest you go to freebsd.org which is the project's website or freebsdfoundation.org and, um, and I'm also open to questions if you want to post those later. So thank you very much. And up next, we have Brian Douglas. Yes, Brian, we can hear you. OK, cool. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about my path to open source. Um, and I'm just going to jump right in. I'm Brian Douglas, BWO. Everything you didn't know about me is in the bottom right-hand corner. That's my Twitter handle. Um, so those will be my details. I'm not going to go into pre presentation mode. Um, it's going to be a pretty short talk, and uh, my slides are linked. So if you want the full screen version, uh, just download the slides. Uh, but my open source journey actually started about uh, back in 2015. Um, I had an idea for a project, uh, me and a couple other people. We wanted to uh, auto invite people to a Slack room. Uh, this was something that Slack did not have built in by default, and there are other, other tools out there for that. Uh, I was lucky enough to find an open source solution for this. Uh, built in Node.js. The only problem was I didn't know how to write JavaScript or Node. Um, so the cool thing about this, I found a solution. I reached out to the maintainer by just going to the project and going to the repo um, and emailing them directly because I didn't know how open source work. I know we've had a couple talks about onboarding open source. Shout out to GitLab's talk around merge. Um, um, I've got the, what they call them, merge guides or something like that. But yeah, it's a, it sounds like a really awesome program. I could definitely use that five years ago uh, and even today. And uh, I say this because this maintainer was nice enough to actually teach me how to do Node.js, teach me how to use their project, and teach me all about the, the community itself. Uh, and the beauty of that is this person was based in LA, but he was traveling in Thailand for a K-pop concert. Uh, so this is actually a screenshot of me and him chatting about how to teach me how to do Node, uh, which is super awesome. Uh, today, I work at this company called GitHub. You probably have heard of it, uh, github.com if you haven't heard of it. And there, I like to say I'm a Beyonce advocate. Um, truly, I'm a, I'm a developer advocate. But I like to compare myself to Beyonce because I'm a fan. Also, Beyonce is a fan of her fans. And uh, she goes to bat for the hive. And that's what I do. And I always constantly try to look for ways to encourage people to do open source. I was just in a Twitter conversation today where I'm going to be mentoring somebody to show them how the basics to get. Uh, so wherever I can pay forward my experience, I'm always looking for that. Um, but a couple years ago, I had an idea of, I always want to get op into open source, but there's never really like a straight path to get there. Uh, every time I find a project, I have no idea where to start. The contributing MD is not the best place to always find the information. And sometimes information is lost in context, which I like to make the joke, if you don't got sauce, then you lost. Uh, Gucci Mane, godfather of trap music, if you haven't heard of it. Um, you know, listen at your own discretion. It's not the best music for everybody, but it, he has a really good quote uh, from an interview he did. Uh, back in 2008. So first question I asked is, how do I get involved in this project? Uh, as I mentioned, contributing MD is a good place to start uh, in different other forms. Like you can actually find whatever the entry point is. Sometimes it's the docs. Uh, definitely the best place to start first. I highly recommend if you have open source projects, make it very clear where people can go to be onboarded asynchronously. Um, 
But recently, I tried to contribute to this project called Graphical, which is a way to consume your GraphQL APIs in, in sort of testing environments. And I found that really quickly, what wasn't listed in the contributing MD was the fact they had a Discord. The Discord was a place where those conversations happen, where you make the connections, so you get the free mentorship. And um, so I built a little tool a couple of years ago when I was discovering how to get into open source consistently called Open Source. Right now, it is a Discord. Uh, we have a community. I do a couple AMAs. I like to uh, chat with people and share the secret sauce of how to get into open source. So uh, if you have friends or if you are interested in getting involved in open source, uh, reach out to me on Twitter. Um, and I could share tools and links and stuff like that. And uh, I'll just end with uh, don't get lost, stay saucy. And uh, thank you very much for bearing with uh, the technical difficulties and staying over a few minutes, even though it, uh, time ended roughly six minutes ago. Um, I'm B Dougie on GitHub, and I'm B Dougie Yo on Twitter. Thank you. <laughs>